Last week I had the absolute pleasure to sit down with the program director for the best ski racing team in the world. I mean, honestly, I can say it right now, the world. And of course, we're talking the Buck Hill Racing Team and Jacob Olson. We had a great discussion discussing everything from his background starting at Nubs Knob Racing all the way down to the future of the Buck Hill Racing Team and what's coming up this upcoming season. I really hope you guys enjoy this interview and if you do, be sure to hit that like button and hit subscribe so you don't miss any of our future videos because we're going to be ramping up our content schedule in the coming months here to prepare for the season which is only a couple of months away. But without further ado, let's dive right into this one. Jacob, how's it going, man? I haven't seen you in a long time. Yeah, good to see you. So for my viewers that don't know, uh, Jacob Olson runs the program director of the Buck Hill Racing Team, which, I mean, let's just call it for what it is, one of the best ski racing programs in, in the world. I mean, I know you might be a little bit hesitant to say that, but I can say that with confidence. I mean, you guys have produced some of the best skiers. Uh, so Jacob, yeah. before we dive into that, let's talk about your history a little bit, because you've got a really cool, in interesting history that really revolves around Midwest skiing. So take me back. Uh, where did you learn to ski? Where'd you grow up and, and what got you into ski racing? Yeah, so I grew up in uh, Petoskey, Michigan. So Nubs Knob was my home ski area. Um, so my dad was on the ski patrol at Nubs Knob for all my years growing up. So it kind of acted as a as a, a daycare on the weekends, at least for me. So I spent a lot of time out there with my dad and I cut me loose and just going out skiing with friends and uh, trying not to get in trouble at Nubs Knob. So. <laughs> For that those that haven't been to Nubs, it's like one of the coolest ski resorts. It's very like old school. Uh, I mean, yeah. do you have like a favorite memory from from Nubs that you'd be willing to share with a, one of the PG ones? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's all it was all all pretty happy in in uh, PG, but I don't know. Just uh, I think kind of moving away, I, I didn't realize how kind of special a place Nubs Knob is. The ownership there, the management is top notch. And I think you've been there. You recognize mm. like how much care they put into everything there. But I think growing up, um, you know, one of my favorite memories would be like in the springtime doing the the Soakers Cup, they call it there, the pond skim. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, and I had at least one victory there, a couple close seconds. Um, still have a picture that my mom cut out, you know, of, of, from the newspaper after a victory in the, the Soakers Cup. But then that and then just some of the spring races they would do would be open, open racing. So anybody could sign up, didn't have to be ussa or usss or anything else you could just go in and sign up and race and they'd have prizes and kind of a celebration uh, with each each of those events so now uh, just a lot of good memories of just just being there in the the management the, the people that work there the whole the whole thing is just a pretty special place so it is i mean uh i was blown away of just the it's it's really like an on the hill product. I mean, you go there and just mm -hmm. like the snow making, the grooming, just the attention to detail from those aspects is uh, is, is really cool. And you know, yeah. you go there and somebody told me like get there really early because you'll see all these phenomenal skiers. They'll ski from like open to like maybe noon, you know, and they'll just be ripping around. Like get there really early, and, and sure enough, I got there. It was like a Wednesday or something, and just wow, I was blown away with the uh, the the caliber of skier that's out there as well. It's just it's crazy, absolutely crazy. Yeah, it's a pretty cool community there for skiers. Uh, pretty <laughs> Absolutely. Fortunate. So, I mean, tell me, how did you get involved with ski racing? Was that obviously it happened at Nubs Knob? So kind of explain how you got involved with the, the whole ski racing side of things. Yeah, so I grew up skiing at, at Nubs with my dad. Um, and then I've got an older brother who I kind of chased around as much as I could. But really, you know, most of the skier, uh, skiers now or ski racers I work with, they start, you know, when they're six, seven, eight years old um, with uh, U.S. Ski and Snowboard. I didn't really start that till I was, I think, a sophomore in high school. So it was pretty late to the game in that sense. But prior to that, it was really those uh, kind of spring open races that that Nubs Knob would would host. It'd be like the K2 duels or the okay. uh, one was called the Nubs Knob Open. Uh, but all those events, we just sign up for, a, I don't know, it was five or ten bucks. And then you get a chance to get some recognition and then win like a, you know, a bag or something at the end of it. It was always a good time. So that was kind of my introduction, my um, how I learned to love racing and then yeah, sophomore year, thanks to my brother, I got in a little earlier than he did into U.S. Ski and Snowboard okay. and started to have some success there with that and then in, into the fist world a little bit. So nice. that was that was where it all began. Yeah, so take a step back here. So you can't you can't slide this through me. So the Batowski Northman and yeah. he's got a couple accolades there. Tell me about those. I mean, you can't you can't just like slip that in there without me saying something. Yeah, that's right. So. <laughs> So and actually, I should mention too, if you go to Nubs Knob and they've got kind of the wall of shame or you call it the wall of fame maybe, but 
it's all the nubs knob open champions over the years and you'll see my name up there <laughs> it's kind of every year following it was like uh chris cumberland jacob olson chris cumberland jacob olson so i was always trying to chase him down but um but yeah the the nubs knob or petoskey northman does the high school team that i race for and i actually think we they, they've had a lot of success over the years but uh I think when I was there, we had, I believe it was three, maybe four state championships for the team. Yeah. Uh, and then I believe I still am the only back-to-back uh, -back slalom state champion, I think. <laughs> don't don't hold me to that, but I think I'm still am, my junior, or my junior senior year was a uh, uh, slalom state champion in, in Michigan. Absolutely. So, that's that's, what, I'm, that's what my fame. record shows as well. So yeah. that's pretty dang impressive uh, coming yeah. out from that area. So. Uh, you couldn't, you couldn't slip that through. I was not going to yeah. let that one slide. <laughs> uh, and then you go to college, right? And you move to Minnesota. Yep. Explain that process and, and what brought you to where you are now in the state of lovely state of Minnesota. Yeah. So um, again, kind of followed my older brother's footsteps, but he uh, he found St. Olaf College through, actually through the, the racers that were part of that program uh, prior to both me and my brother. But we go to some of the races in Minnesota, like uh, the Atmore uh, Fist Memorial Race up in Duluth at Spirit Mountain. Long history of great racing up there in another race that St. Olaf athletes typically attend. Uh, so going there, my brother kind of got introduced to some of the team, some of his uh, teammates, I think it was Josh Kinzer, uh, Joachim Rasmussen was another one, um, but kind of got into the fold. They invited him over to take a look. He sure. went there and then for me, kind of the same thing, followed my brother out there a little bit, um, but got to know some of the athletes and uh, through some of the Midwest races, I guess, um, kind of piqued my interest and ended up at St. Olaf because of that. Yeah, that's really cool. And obviously you graduated and uh, I can't remember your degrees were finance and I can't. So I was a uh, philosophy and econ major. Okay, that's uh, what So was. putting those both those degrees to good use now in the ski industry. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so I was going to say, like, was this like the game plan? I mean, did you want to work in the ski industry like when your whole life or is this just something like how did this explain how this transpired? Because you, you went to school there and then you ended up uh, at the Buck Hill Racing uh, team just shortly, shortly after that, or almost right after you graduated. So how did that all work out? So I think uh, I don't know if you call it serendipity or the path of least resistance sometimes <laughs> with my life, but <laughs> I went to St. Olaf, I uh, got a great education there, had a really good experience. Um, they're, they're also, I should say, one of the, the only team in the Midwest, um, at least at that time, that was um, had a varsity program. So you got mm -hmm. to ski and they, you know, they covered the, the cost of going to the races and being a part okay. of that program. Um, but when I was there, I uh, started out as an English major, uh, then decided I didn't like to write that much. <laughs> so I became <laughs> switched over to philosophy, which was great. And then to appease my parents, uh, I, I added the econ major just to say I'm doing something, uh, you know, that I'm, that's useful, you know. But uh, got involved with Buck Hill again, kind of through my brother a little bit. His relationships okay. prior to me being there, kind of uh, paving the way. Um, and then immediately after graduation, I started coaching, um, uh, coaching at Buck Hill, uh, pretty much full time in the winter. Mm -hmm. um, as I was quote unquote looking for my my real job. <laughs> yeah, so. this is about like what uh, maybe 2007, 2006 ish around that time frame. Yeah, so I graduated okay. 2006, and so I would have started coaching that same year. 2006 would have been my first year. So 2006, 07 season at Buck Hill would have been my first year with the program. Okay, and well, I mean, like, what did you do when you first started with Buck Hill? Was it just like coaching? Uh, was it even like volunteer at that time when you were? coaching no i got i got paid uh okay. so just but just a, a staff coach i didn't have a, a position with an age group or anything but just um i like working with with kids and with athletes mm -hmm. uh so i kind of fit in that way got along well with the kids with the parents with the other coaches um and was kind of willing to to go wherever and do whatever so anytime there was a camp opportunity a race you know that they needed a coach for i would jump onto it mm -hmm. um and just kind of uh yeah, just that was it for several years, actually, just kind of working my way up and building those relationships with the kids and with the families and with the with Eric Seiler, of course. I mean, looking back, I mean, would you even have thought, you know, going to college and stuff that you would be it at Buck Hill in the role that you are now and just like how, you know, how crazy has it been just to, I don't know, just be part of such a such a legacy when it comes to the ski racing world? Yeah, it's pretty wild. Um, you know, I, I did not imagine that at all. I kind of uh, 
imagined having to get another, you know, the quote unquote real job <laughs> that we all dread. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> ended up going back to school actually to get my uh, work towards my teaching certification. Okay. Um, it was pretty darn close to doing that. I actually never completed that, but it was uh, as I got towards the the student teaching and started to get into the classroom, I kind of realized uh, indoors and like with kids that weren't always super stoked mm -hmm. to be doing what you're trying to do with them um, wasn't really what I was uh, into. So yeah, from there, I kind of went back into coaching more again um, yeah. and then ended up down at St. Olaf actually with, uh, with that program to get a little more experience as it's kind of the head coach or um, organizer for a, a, a bigger ski team. So let's talk about the Buck Hill Racing Team. This is a, a team that has been around for a long, long time in different capacities. And I mean, really has just produced some of, I mean, just amazing skiers. I mean, I can't even name them all because there's just so many. Uh, yeah. Get, tell me a little bit about your program and, and what you guys do, what, what your goal is and uh, all elements of, the, of that program. Yeah, so uh, the program... You know, it existed before Eric was here, but um, I think it was 1969, I believe. Uh, former owner Chuck Stone um, had some kids, his, uh, I believe just his daughters, but some kids in the program. And he wanted to kind of put the, the hill on the map and get his, his daughters more involved in ski racing, as, my, as I understand it. So he wanted to get the best guy. So he hired this guy, Eric Seiler, um, who'd been around a, a, for a little bit by that point. Uh, to come in and coach and and get some some champions or um, get some wins at some races, so I brought Eric in. Um, and Eric Eric's philosophy I think has pretty much stayed the same. Um, it's kind of our program philosophy to this day, uh, where it's kind of three basic principles, and that's uh, repetition, uh, demonstration, uh, and then just focusing on the fundamentals. So keeping it pretty simple, um, letting this, letting the the athletes ski their natural way. I'm not trying to change them too much, but just teaching them kind of good balance, the basics, um, and then just doing a lot of runs um, and then and then showing them really good skiing as often as we can. I mean, talk a little bit about, you know, like Buck Hill's importance and, and the venue's importance as well to your guys' success. So the venue, it's, it's kind of the perfect pitch. So, um, you know, it's not all that steep where we train, uh, but it's, it's also not, not super flat. So, it's just the right pitch where the athletes they get on the hill, um, and it's they're always trying to go faster. They're never they're never having to break or slow down to to maintain, you know, their their to stay in the course. So they're always trying to go faster. Um, we have a giant start ramp that was built back in I think '98. Um, that was a, a donation from one of the, the families on the team, but that kind of gives the athletes a chance to get a really good start and really be you know basically full speed by the time they hit that first gate. So. Mm -hmm. Even though we're small, uh, we, we use the space super efficiently and uh, between the rope toe, giving the kids a ton of laps, um, and then the, just the pitch of the hill itself, it's it's pretty ideal for taking a lot of slalom runs. Yeah, I mean, I agree. Like I, it's like you said, it's not super steep, but it's steep enough to get you moving at a good pace, get some really good turns in. And mm -hmm. then, I mean, just the setup with the rope, it's just, it's, it's like ideal. I mean, watching yeah. kids just lap this nonstop. I mean, they can get more runs in probably an hour than you would in most places out West or anywhere, because just repetition it goes back to what you, we were talking about repetition uh, and demonstration. I mean, what a great venue. I mean, everything's within eyesight yeah. too. It's like, you can watch the entire time. Well, you know, talk about that dynamic, how you, I got to watch you coach uh, every child, every kid that comes down, you get to individually go up to and kind of like coach and, and tell them what you saw down that whole run. That's got to be pretty cool that you can see the entire kind of lane. Yeah, you can see the whole thing. Uh, and it's 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 pretty neat the way we we run it. Like we, we run pretty rapid fire, but it again it kind of goes to our principles, our fundamentals, our philosophy for coaching is to try to keep it simple. So uh, we try to give a little bit of feedback, um, pretty basic. It could be as simple as you know adding a pole plant or. You know, putting more pressure on the outside ski or adjusting your line a little bit but trying to be consistent with that and hit every athlete and it doesn't have to be every run but we do get to see them a lot and to your point like you know on the on the race hill they can get you know easily 20 plus runs in, in our two-hour practice and i think last year we actually set the record 
uh, one of the Barkwell boys with like 40, 44 runs, I think, in two hours. It was nuts. What? Oh my wouldn't God. call it the most productive practice, but he definitely accomplished the most <laughs> runs that day. It was pretty cool. Uh, I couldn't do that. I'm too old for that stuff now. It's yeah. Like, uh... <laughs> Oh, man. But that's part of it too is you know even on the you know minnesota is not known for having you know really pleasant winters you know it's mm-hmm. pretty cold not usually a lot of snow but just brutally cold and pretty windy up there but with the rope toe you know the kids are lapping they're on that rope toe every like call it 45 seconds every minute <laughs> going to the top and then they have to hike up the ramp come down and they do it again you know so even on like the, the single digit days, like kids mm-hmm. are you know ditching jackets, shedding layers because they're just overheating because they're working so hard on the rope toe and climbing the ramp. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's so cool. And you kind of just alluded to it a little bit, but this whole ski racing uh, program and all this, it goes so much deeper than just the sport itself, right? Like watching these kids interact with each other, have fun, going to different areas to, to go to meets and, and uh, camps and things like that. Talk about the dynamic and how, it goes a little bit deeper than just the actual sport of skiing. Yeah. So actually one of our kind of team mottos um, is an Eric Seiler quote, which is, uh, you know, that we like to think of ourselves as creating champions in ski racing and in life. So a lot of the same things that you need in ski racing, like I think kind of the biggest one, even Lindsey Vaughn talks about it all the time is grit. So the ability to keep going, to uh, take failure. There's a, a ton of failure in ski racing. Um, but be able to push through that and kind of get motivated to do it again, to get better, um, to get back to the top of the hill and do it again, even if even if you're not feeling it. You know, that that kind of character um, building aspect of the sport is takes the, the kids a long way. So you see the kids later in life. And that's another cool part of being a coach is just seeing them go off and become doctors, lawyers, teachers, whatever it is. They a lot of them become leaders in whatever whatever they end up doing. So it's, it's pretty uh, rewarding in that way too. Talk about the different age groups that you have. Like when would somebody, what, what age is the right age to get started in something like this? And and what kind of different levels and skill levels do you need mm-hmm. to be at to get involved with ski racing? So yeah, for our program, um, again, I'd say we're pretty unique um, in the Midwest and probably in the, in the country for kind of how we actually operate. But just looking at the numbers today and we'll have we're actually going to, I was talking with another coach that we're going to really kick butt at the U10 level this year with those eight and nine year olds. We have a really <laughs> solid crew. Um, usually we don't have that many eight year olds or nine year olds in the program. Yeah. Um, That'd be pretty mature to do, to, uh, to, to be, be a part, part of the of program that, and yeah. handle it uh, at that age. But this year we've got a pretty solid group. But to kind of get into the program, the usual path is to go through like a development program. So uh, most of them come through Buck Hill through mm-hmm. what we call our D team or development team. And they uh, work with their instructors there um, with a lot of kind of PSIA based um, instruction, kind of an introduction to gates and introduction to competition. And then, you know, we kind of work with those coaches in that program and the families to then say, you know, okay, maybe this kid's ready. Uh, Maybe this kid needs another year. But Mm -hmm. usually by the time they're 10, 11, 12 years old, if they have an interest in, in going further with ski racing, then they'll make their way over to the Buck Hill Ski Racing team okay. and start doing the USSS program and joining us on, on Olympic Dreams over here. If they're interested in that, you guys have uh, links on your website and registration forms and all that stuff, I would assume, correct? Yeah, so we actually, uh, it's another you know interesting piece of our team. I think we are unique in the Midwest in this way, um, but we, we are owned by the Hill. So our team is actually, you pay your team fees, that goes to Buck Hill Inc. Mm-hmm. Um, and it would, Buck Hill hires hires me, hires the coaches, mm-hmm. um, and covers kind of all the insurance, et cetera, for all the important kind of boring pieces. Uh, we also have then a club, a 501c3 nonprofit okay. mm-hmm. um, that kind of supports almost like a fundraiser or like a booster club for a high school team, you could think of it. Okay. Uh, but kind of helps cut the costs a little bit, subsidize the program in certain ways. Um, so we, we have two places to look for information. One is buckhill.com. Mm-hmm. You can look up our team there, but also BuckHillSkiRacingTeam.com would be our club's club's uh, website, which has a little more specific information about the program. Gotcha. And you guys do obviously some events as well, and you have a, a pretty big one, probably your biggest one coming up with the tent sale. Talk about that a little bit and, uh, you know, yeah. what, what that event's all about. So, yeah, the biggest tents or the biggest uh, event fundraiser we have for the year for the uh, 501c3 club is the Buck Hill Tent Sale, Buck Hill Ski Racing Club Tent Sale. Okay. And that's coming up the end of the month. It's always the last week in September. So uh, this year it's the 24th, the 26th. And um, 
yeah, it's, uh, we bring in vendors, but anybody can bring in equipment to sell. Um, you can either donate it or you can put in the swap at, at a commission, basically. So we get 20% from that sale. Okay. Uh, but all of that, all of that uh, money or the profit from that sale goes towards the club. And it's 100% is directed to the athletes to, to basically make the season a little bit more affordable and to help them have a better experience. To keep the, the ski racing team as like one of the pr premier in the country. Um, to keep it a high level. So you guys do offer a variety of camps too, on top of just the, uh, obviously the program, you guys do these um, offsite kind of camps. Talk about those a little bit and what you guys have going on. You know, one of the challenges we have as a program is, um, you know, if you look at, at the programs across the nation, you know, we're in the Midwest, all the programs here are very, are priced extremely low. Like you can, I don't know, like a Vail program, if you're a, a 18 year old athlete, it's like somewhere around $20,000 if you do their, their fist program or here it's like twenty six hundred dollars that's wild so, yeah so it's being in the midwest we we like to you know think of ourselves as offering a really good value for, for yeah. the for the cost um so you know one of the challenges though is that we're really only um you know a, a seasonal program we don't have have the the year-round aspect mm -hmm. um so part of that's just um because our kids are doing other things throughout the year. They're at the lake in the summer, doing football in the fall, whatever it is. But one of the pieces is the, the winter season is pretty short here where, where other programs in Colorado, other places have access to, you know, maybe eight months of skiing, seven, eight months, six months. We have, you know, in a good year four. So we go out to Colorado in November, starting or the end of October here. Okay. And we'll start hosting camps there to kind of extend our season and um, get kids on snow, get the miles on on their skis, and uh, just get them a, you know, get get them ready, I guess, for those early December races that some of them will attend. Yeah, and that's obviously that's coming up. And then you guys also do you do summer camp as well? Yeah. So right now, uh, yeah, currently through through this last year, still um, Eric Seiler runs a summer camp out at Mount Hood, and that actually is um, cool history there. But he started the first. Um, commercial summer camps on Mount Hood in 1956. Holy cow. So you can do the math. But, uh, <laughs> he's, he's, it wasn't, he hasn't been there consecutively every year, but right, most right, of those but years still. he was at Hood. He took a few years where he went to Red Lodge in Montana. Right. Okay. But a pretty amazing yeah. run up there. Um, and he, you know, we had that camp again this year. Um, and that's the one we, we support with our program. Okay. Um, I go out to help Eric uh, with that camp as well each year. But yeah, two weeks in June, we typically do out there and we'll have, you know, roughly, you know, 60 to 70 kids, you know, per session out there for a couple of weeks. Sure. So another, sure. another opportunity for the kids to get on snow and extend that season. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I mean, speaking of Eric, I can't, I can't talk to you without talking about Eric. And I've had the pleasure to, to sit down and talk with him and, and, and just see him work. And anybody I think that has seen him coach, uh, yeah, it's just like next level. I mean, what do you think from, I mean, you, you've seen so much more of it than I have. What do you think makes Eric so good at what he does and just interacting with the children? I mean, just describe that a little bit to, to people that have never seen it. Yeah. So I think, you know, we talked about it a little bit already, but just the program philosophy that he developed here, you know, that's, that's kind of produced, you know, all these champions, including, you know, likes of Christina Kosnick and Lindsey Vaughn, um, two of the most famous, obviously. But, you know, the basics, the three basic principles of, you know, keeping it simple, letting, letting the athletes ski naturally, um, the repetition aspect, and then, you know, demonstration, showing them what good skiing looks like. So, you know, he's, he's mellowed quite a bit, I'd say even in the time I've known him, but, uh, you know, he used to give you a really hard time as a coach if you didn't bring your ski poles to an event. <laughs> like, how are you supposed to show the kids how to ski if you don't have your ski poles with you? Or if you have a cup of coffee in your hand, he'd give you a hard time. Really? You, should poles, you should be ready to show the kids how it's done. So, you know, that aspect, you know, just the, the simple nature of the program he developed here, uh, the philosophy he developed for creating good skiers. I think, you know, again, you know, the creating the idea of creating ski, uh, champions in ski racing and in life, you know, it's about more than the sport. I think he's always recognized that the sport that we're into is, is really incredible and it yeah. just creates good people. Uh, so you'll see like people throughout the years, like always come back to see Eric, you know, it doesn't matter if it was from 1970 or 19, you know, 2000, everybody wants to come back and say hi to him. Uh, and then I think just his ability to just say the right things at the right time, 
you know, at the at a championship event, you know, the energy he can bring to a to a room full of athletes and parents is second to none. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've had that experience a number of times when we'll be, you know, call it junior championships or at Winter Park Ball Camp, and you know, Eric is maybe coming a few days later, and we're having these meetings with the kids, with the parents, and it's going fine, but it's just kind of like. Missing you know, something, you know. It's just missing something. Jake's boring, you know. He's just <laughs> talking up here, going through what needs to be said, but that's it. And then Eric will come in, and all of a sudden, it's like this energy just enters the room, and it's like everybody is so stoked all of a sudden to be here, to be skiing. Uh, it's just a, like he just has a way of inspiring people that's like second to none. I've never, never met another person that can do that the way he does it. So it's something I think, you know, never think uh, anybody could do do what he does but something we all try to replicate i think is nice. is having that energy and having that ability to connect with the the athletes and the families as well yeah so yeah. it's just uh, it's just pretty outstanding to see um and i think the the other big thing that i've taken away from eric is um you know a number of years ago we were sitting down i don't know talking about camp or something but he kind of started talking and and if you just let him go, he'll come up with these like just gold, gold pieces of wisdom that he'll just drop. And and the one that I'll never forget is just that he talked about fun and how how fun is the biggest motivator for athletes, for youth athletes. So if the especially the younger kids, if they're having a great time in the sport, training, interacting with their friends, interacting with the coaches, they're going to want to come back and they're also going to have a lot more success. So that was. I know just a lot of good things you go on and on about Eric, obviously, but yeah, those are the big ones for me. It's yeah, I, I totally agree. And until you yeah. see it, I think you have, I, we talk about it all day, but for anybody that hasn't seen him interact and, and just coach, I mean, it's, it's just, I, I, I don't even know how to describe it. You just have to go see it the way he can energize these, these kids to, to ski faster, better and, and have more fun is, is just something that, I don't know. I don't know what it is, but my gosh, I can't, I remember after filming that day, I was just like, wow, that was, that was an experience that I will remember for the rest of my life. Cause that was really, really cool. Um, yeah. I, I did think I, for a while, I thought maybe because of his age, he's, in, he's been around forever. Right. I mean, he started those camps in 1956 yeah. at, yeah. at Mount Hood, but I thought maybe it was like his age, like he's older than the parents. He's older than the athletes. Like, so you look up to him like, you know, he can say whatever he wants because that's who he is. But it's I really just think right? yeah. with his personality, like it's not all, um, it's not necessarily nice all the time. He like tells you what you need to hear and it might yeah. be a slap in the face, you know, with what he's saying, but um, but you need to hear it. And people, for the most part, you take it in stride. And if you listen to him, it usually results in a, you know, something special, I'd say. Yeah. And he's still skiing. I mean, that's the craziest part. It's like he got out last yeah. year, I know. I mean... Whoa, yeah, he, just... yeah, he went up to this summer, you know, it was, it was crazy warm out at Hood this year and uh-huh. he made it up, I think it was two days he came up to the top, which is no small feat for anybody, oh, yeah. you know, to make it to yeah. the top of the Palmer Glacier at Mount Hood. And he was up there twice and I think, you know, one, he wants to, you know, prove to himself that he can still do it um, mm-hmm. and he certainly can. Uh, but then the second piece, I think, his his granddaughters were up there. So I think he really oh, okay. wanted to see, see them ski a little bit. That's got to be so rewarding and, and so cool. To yeah. So uh, any other Eric stories that you get to tell me or funny moments? I think, you know, you can ask anybody and everybody has an Eric story is another <laughs> cool thing about Eric. But um, I'll never forget at uh, junior championships, I think it was probably, I don't know, it was at Vail maybe in 2012, maybe 2011, somewhere in that that era. But um we had a couple of really top athletes um, would be what we call now U 16s, I think. Okay. Um, but it would be, it was Tommy Anderson and Louie Wynn, I remember. And I had the, the opportunity uh, to set one of the slalom courses for the next day. Okay. Um, so Eric's pretty particular about how, how the sets go, but that usually set in the morning, but that time I, I got to set the night before or the day before, Okay. Uh, which was like great. And, but it's also like, you have to think about it a lot then. Like you've got a full 24 hours to think, man, how bad did I screw this thing up or <laughs> whatever. So I went through that course, like probably four or five times. Um, you know, I was really proud of it. I remember they had these like kind of whales in the hill of snow that you got to use. That was kind of challenging though, on gold peak. Sure. And I was, pretty proud of this course. I thought, man, this thing is dialed in. Like our guys are going to rip this thing. Um, and I think I got a call 
I want to say it was like 5.30 in the morning the next day. And Eric, I wouldn't say frantically, but very sternly telling me to get to the mountain like now because he wants to talk to me. And he's looking up from the bottom. You can't see anything, but he's, you know, saying, you know, it doesn't look very good from here. And if our guys ski out, that's on you. And it was basically telling me that I'm fired you know, <laughs> if, uh, if our guys don't perform. And thankfully, I think Tommy and Louie, I can't remember the order, but I think they, on that first run, they came down like first and third. And I think like, I don't know, it was like half the veil field, like the veil guys really struggled with it. So I was like kind of patting myself on the back. <laughs> <laughs> Eric finally came over and, you know, it was, you know, gave me a thumbs up because he was, he was proud that Tommy and Louie had a good result down it. So might have been the end of it for me there, but <laughs> I survived. Live it on the edge. Day. Yeah. That's hilarious. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. He's, yeah, I can tell. Like, he's somebody like when he, you know, if he sternly tells you something, I'd be like, yeah, I'd be a little scared too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That was a pretty, pretty stressful, stressful day for Jake as I was standing on the side just praying and crossing my fingers that Tommy and Louie, please make it to the bottom. And they both did. So. It was a it was a good day. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Uh, yeah. Now, before I wrap things up, I have a, a list of questions here that I fielded from my viewers. I will yeah. base and let you know that some of these make no sense to me. Uh, some All of right. them, I don't even know what they mean. But we'll go through them rapid fire. So just give me a quick mm -hmm. response, and we'll move on to the next one. Um, how many members of the U.S. ski team started at Buck? Oh, that's a good question, but. Uh, it's got to be close to 20 and say I actually don't know that number because um, there's some names I wouldn't even recognize that that right. maybe made it to the to the D team but a lot over the years and um, even currently we've got there's three athletes that got their start at Buck Hill on the US ski team right now so pretty proud of that but a lot over the years probably That's close to 20 if not upwards of that. Uh, who is Radder you or your brother? My brother definitely definitely <laughs> more red. <laughs> I've seen some photos of your brother. He looked like he was, he could rip back. back he was wild, yeah, wild child, dreadlocks. Yeah, he's still long here, but he had dreadlocks back in the day. Like, you know, very fast ski racer, but uh, chasing him down the mountains, that's like, really, that's where my love of the sport came from, was following, following him around. So definitely my brother takes that one. How fast is the rope toe? I don't know how fast it is, but it uh, it takes uh, time. It takes roughly 45 seconds to get to the, from the bottom okay. to the top. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It's so fast. Fast. If like, you ever asked that, it's, yeah. it's fast. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What What is the perfect pre race breakfast? Pre race breakfast. Uh, I think it depends if you're a coach or an athlete. For a coach, <laughs> probably something greasy and a big cup of coffee. Uh, for an athlete, I think it depends, but something that uh, doesn't upset your stomach, I'd say. Yeah. Um, is screaming war cries while hitting each gate industry standard? <laughs> <laughs> It is not, but it's a one of uh, uh, one of the people that looks up to Eric the most. I'd say of all the coaches I work with is is uh, four or five time Olympian now. You lose track after so many years, but Sarah Schlepper. Okay. And she is famous for the war cry out of the start gate. So I think if you asked her, it'd probably be mandatory. Yeah. <laughs> I like that one. So. That's good. How tight should your race suit be? Oh man, well it depends. I heard a uh, rumor for a while that the Canadian team you know, wore nothing. So then it, under, <laughs> underneath, it'd be, I'd say fairly tight in that, in that regard. But uh, here you want to be able to breathe, I, sh I guess, and keep circulation. And squeaking off your skin. That's how tight yeah. it is. Yeah. <laughs> how many laps do your skiers get in an hour of practice? We kind of covered this already, but. Yeah, so uh, usually 20, but record was 44 last season. That's crazy. That's yeah. crazy. Um, do you know Lindsey Vaughn? <laughs> I've met her a few times actually, uh, but I, I don't know her so much on a personal level, but I am pretty proud. My daughter got to meet her um, a couple years ago when she came to Buck Hill. You did the, the rope toe dedication, right? And, yep, yeah, rope toe dedication and um, got to talk to her a little bit there. And one of the coolest people, just the, you know, not part of the plan, but she just stuck around to talk to every single athlete and every single person that came to see her. She made time really? to talk to those people. It was unbelievable. That's yeah. super cool. What, what an inspiration, especially for, 
uh, younger girls coming up through the program and things like, I mean, it's just so cool to see that. I mean, it's, yeah, it's yeah. Awesome. Very cool role model, top notch. Who should we be watching from the Midwest this season from a racing side of the sport? I don't know if they mean pro or, or what division, but just give me like some insights as to who we should be keeping an eye on. Obviously, pa Paula Moulton has been killing it. Yeah, Paula Moulton's, you know, I think, what is she probably the, you know, number two tech skier mm -hmm. uh, for the U.S. women right now. Um, Camden Palmquist uh, grew up in Egan over here okay. uh, from the Midwest. He's another one to watch. And then, of course, Isaiah Nelson, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, still keeps Buck Hill by his name even uh, on that one. So he's he's working his way up the ranks. Another one to watch. Uh, and then kind of locally at the younger age groups, um, you know, we've got uh, Zach Bayon from our program. He'll be one to watch. He's uh, okay. part of a national training group. And then um, got a few others, Skylar Shepard, uh, Corinna Westermeyer, Emily Gustafson, Kyan Hoppy. I go on and on. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you see him, you see him coming through the um, race. You like got, yeah, you got all yeah. these, yeah, you got them yeah. like just highlighted, just like, okay, watch this guy for a little while. Yeah. What? So I'll, I'll preface this one really quick. So, yeah. uh, Jacob has, uh, two younger, they're girls, right? Both girls. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Anya and Scotty. Yep. Uh, what is your current favorite children's book? Ooh, that's a good question. Uh, <laughs> we read a lot of those. I say my daughter's right now. We just got uh, gifted on top of spaghetti. Okay. Uh, yeah. Singing that one along with her has been pretty fun. Uh, but for me, it'd be uh, probably anything Shel Silverstein. So light in the attic, we'll yep. call it. B yep. Book of Palms. Yeah. Classic stuff. Classic stuff. Yeah. Uh, what is your favorite place to ski in the Midwest outside of Buffalo? Nubs Knob, definitely. Yeah. Uh, Nubs Knob <laughs> is epic. Uh, you go there, you gotta like try the breakfast sandwich, um, yep. the chicken chicken noodle soup. That's that's top notch at, at Nub's Knob. Um, and then one place I wanna get back to, I was there on probably the worst time to go, but uh, was Mount Bohemia. Yeah. But at the time yeah. I was there, it was uh, the whole, the water was all frozen around it so they didn't get lake effect snow. Okay. And it was brutal, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, just getting a taste of the terrain there. It's like, man, that would be you can see a the really potential cool place the if there was some snow. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And your last one, what is your go-to opera drink? Opera drink? Uh, probably right now would be anything, uh, bubbly water, actually. Bubbly Just water. Stay away from alcohol, but uh, anything uh, with bubbles in it. So LaCroix, I'd say LaCroix Pamplemousse would be maybe my favorite. <laughs> All right, before I let you go, is there anything else that you want to talk about that we haven't covered at all? Uh, no, I just, I think, um, yeah, if uh, anybody needs equipment out there, um, our tent sale at Buck Hill at the end of the month is a huge opportunity to come out and say hi and to get set up for the season. I just encourage you to, I guess, I don't know, support your local ski shops and support your local areas. You know, everybody kind of operates on a shoestring budget, whether it's ski areas or the uh, um, ski shops. So, Get out there, spend your money at those places. Um, and I think, uh, yeah, I mean, it's just uh, the Midwest ski culture is so cool. So I want to applaud you too for kind of highlighting how cool it is and kind of shining a spotlight on that. Because for those, those of us that know it, it's, it's it's pretty cool in the Midwest to be a skier. Yeah, I agree. It's like, it's really cool. It's really uh, special. And I, I, you know, I'm glad that we are able to kind of start to shed some light to that. So thank you. I appreciate that. That's very nice. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so it's been awesome. So. Jacob, thank you so much for taking the time. I know you're super busy getting ready for the uh, the season. I'll definitely see you guys at the tent sale. So um, I'll see you floating around there. I'll probably be there all the days. Um, so I'll see nice. you guys then. But uh, thanks again. I re really appreciate you taking the time. Yeah, thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Thanks again to Jacob Olson for taking the time to chat with me. It's always a pleasure to chat with you and get some insight as to what the future racers look like. If you guys want to learn more about their program or their tent sale that's upcoming, I'll be sure to drop some links below. But until next time, guys, I hope all of you guys have a great off season. Pray for snow, and I'll see you guys out there.